ahead. All right, well, thank you, Tracy. Um, as Tracy mentioned, I'm Taylor Dame, the product manager for Makeup Air here at GreenHack. Uh, I've been with GreenHack about seven and a half years now. Spent most of my time as an application engineer here. Um, I first started in, in our Makeup Air division, focused on those products specifically. Um, the last couple of years, I've been doing a little stint um, focusing on all products, but warehouses and specifically. So this is really, really familiar to me um, in my time here um, at GreenHack. So it's gonna be a, a kind of a great opportunity to, to talk to you guys a little bit about warehouse heating with direct gas fired equipment. Um, so as we're kind of going through here, again, as Tracy mentioned, enter any questions you have into the Q&A and we'll address those at the end of the presentation. So starting off here with the, um, you know, with these applications, you know, we're looking at heating, you know, warehouses, distribution centers, or there are large open spaces, say like manufacturing facilities. You know, these are great applications for utilizing direct gas fired makeup air units as your primary heating source in a lot of these applications. You know, it's one of the challenges you're going to deal with in, in these is going to be, you know, numerous dock doors. So we have lots of infiltration through some of those doors. We've got tall ceilings that makes, you know, you know, it makes that stratification become a concern where that hot air rises to the ceiling and it'll lose it through the roof. And then additionally, you know, especially in warehouses where we've got tall racking, you know, e heat distribution can be pretty difficult in those large spaces. So we're going to talk through some of those challenges as well as various other design considerations when looking at space heating applications. So we'll start by just kind of going through an overview of space heating design. So we're going to talk about um, you know, skin load or conduction losses to your, to your walls, roof, exposed envelope. Talk a little bit about usable heat, which is the amount of energy, you know, we have available to heat that air inside that building um, from our equipment and how that, that uh, you know, how that can be used to, to heat, the, heat the facility. We'll talk a little bit about infiltration. So that's our cold air gain through typically dock doors is our primary, uh, primary infiltration source on a warehouse or distribution center. And then lastly, we'll talk a little bit about heat distribution um, with the space heating design. Once we get through some of this, well then we'll kind of dive into space heating equipment, more specifically looking at the direct gas fired equipment. So starting off with you know, your skin load and you know, calculating that heat loss to the building, you know, that's gonna be affected by your, you know, your surface area that it's exposed, your insulation values, your outdoor air and indoor temperatures. And, you know, there's, you can do these calculations by hand, they're not too difficult. Um, but a lot of times, right, we've got software that helps us, um, you know, address some of these heating loads. The big thing here really that I always like to stress is, you know, that calculation or that software is only as accurate as the information you're providing into it. The big thing is making sure that we've got the right information plugged in because we can kind of see as our insulation values change between that case one and case two there, um, as well as just even our temperatures that we're trying to heat to in that space. We can see drastic differences in our overall heating load and making sure we have that accurate information is really, really critical for, for skin load. And this is typically, you know, your primary, um, primary heating load that you think about in a lot of facilities is just that, you know, heat loss by conduction to, to the building envelope. Now, when we're going to, you know, deal with any warehouses or applications like that, um, Typically, we got to also watch for our ventilation requirements. So not only do we, are we going to have a pretty significant load on that large facility, but we're also going to have a pretty significant load from just meeting our ASHRAE 62 or International Mechanical Code requirements of 0 0.06 CFM per square foot for these spaces. Now, the more recent versions of ASHRAE 62.1 and IMC also require um, 10 CFM per person in these spaces. Uh, so that's, you know, something to take into account, but typically um, in, in most of the, the code requirements, um, we're still utilizing that 0 0.06 CFM per square foot as a minimum. So that's one thing to pay attention to. Now, when we look at that and how much of a load that creates on these spaces. So in this example, probably colder than what you're going to see in Georgia for winter design, but, you know, a good chunk of the country, we're designing a lot around zero degrees of the winter design temperature. You know, and if we got to get that air up to 65 degrees in the space, you can see our ventilation load here is pretty significantly, you know, pretty significant. You know, 44% of our total load, if we add in our skin load or conduction load to the, to the building, plus that ventilation load, just to get that air from zero degrees to 65, you can see we're, we're at a significant portion of our overall heating load. So when we're selecting heating equipment for these applications, it's really important to include 
and account for that ventilation, those ventilation requirements. The other thing that um, we got to account for is when we are selecting equipment and we're heating outside air, we've got to account for the fact that all those BTUs that are associated with that unit, so if we select a unit that's say a million BTUs in heating capacity, but it's heating outside air, a portion of that heat is kind of lost to us. You know, used to heat that outside air from outside air temperature to room neutral. And if we just supply air at room neutral temperature, it's got no usable heat or heat available to heat the, the building and offset that skin load in the, in the space. I can always think of this like, you know, you've got your cup of coffee sitting on your desk and if you're anything like me, you get busy in the morning and it gets cold unless you're, you know, unless you're using a Yeti or something, right? Keeps it nice and insulated. But if once that coffee gets cold, it's room temperature, you go back to the pot, you'll grab some nice hot coffee, you'll, you'll fill the cup up full way, and it's going to warm up in temperature, right? Well, if the pot was off, and that's room temperature as well, and you dump coffee in there, it's going to stay the same temperature. Same idea with the air in the facility. The higher the temperature that we're providing into the building, the more usable heat that air has. The more air we add, the more heat's available. And that's really the portion we need to watch for. It's that difference in temperature between the you know, room temperature and our supply temperature times the amount of airflow that we have. Your 1.08 times CFM times delta T is, is your uh, calculation there. Now, when we look at, say, you know, traditional heating sources, some of the more traditional heating sources you may think of, say, a unit heater or a radiant tube heater where they're not bringing in any outside air, that full BTU is, is effectively usable heat because we're just recirculating there and here in the facility. It's really important to pay attention to this when we're dealing with equipment that's also addressing some of that outdoor air load. So now we kind of talked about, you know, addressing, you know, the skin load, the ventilation load. What about infiltration? And, you know, when it comes to infiltration, this can be a pretty significant load in a lot of warehouse spaces. You know, we've got typically a lot of leakage around dock doors is the primary primary um, form of leakage. So if we look at, you know, kind of an example here, if you had that open, open dock door, you're gonna get cold air or wind blowing in at that door and it may leak around seals from the, uh, from a, uh, a truck backed up to it. And it's gonna work its way into the building. When it does so, it's cold, dense air. So it tends to fall to the floor and displace the warm air in the facility. So it forces that warm air to the ceiling. So it's gonna increase that floor to ceiling stratification. You, get, you feel those cold drafts if you're working in those dock areas, so it makes the space feel less comfortable. And ultimately, we've got to heat that infiltration air as well, which is going to increase our heating loads. So when we deal with infiltration, the big thing we want to look at doing is trying to pressurize our building. That's going to be the best way to prevent or combat infiltration in some of these large, large warehouses. And to do that, we introduce that outside air. So we had to introduce some for our ventilation rate. We may even want to introduce more outside air to bring that space pressure up within the facility and help prevent that cold air from leaking into the building. So one example of this is some testing that was done that um, one, of our, one of our customers had done around um, air leakage through dock doors. And so what we have is a blower door test here where we had a truck backed up to a dock with dock seals on it. And then Blower door testing basically um, was, was there to pressurize an enclosure around that, that truck and trailer, and then measure the amount of air that leaks into the facility at various wind speeds. They then raised and lowered the building pressure inside to show the diff, to, to determine the difference in air leakage around those truck docks and into the facility at different wind speeds. And you can see, you know, at just a five mile an hour wind speed here and you know, neutral pressure within the space, that five mile an hour simulated wind speed created almost a thousand CFM of infiltration air. By raising that space pressure to almost an eighth of an inch in indoor pressure, they were able to eliminate that infiltration completely at five to 10 mile an hour winds and reduce it significantly at, larger, at higher wind speeds. So by creating that building pressurization, effectively significantly reduce that dock door infiltration or prevent it altogether um, with, with that strategy. So it can be really effective at making that space feel more comfortable, 
as well as addressing that infiltration load on a space. Now, the other thing we got to consider when we look at heating large facilities like this with tall ceilings is that stratification as well. And stratification is where we're going to get that warm air. It tends to rise. You know, it's less dense. It wants to rise towards the ceiling. And eventually, we lose a lot of that heat through the roof, right? So if we look at an example warehouse here, we'll just say it's a 300,000 square foot building. And we've got a pretty even floor to ceiling temperature, say 65 at the floor, 68 at the ceiling. We've got just over a million BTOs per hour of heat loss at, say, 10 degrees outdoor temp through that to that roof. Now, if we were to have that same building, and we're going to heat it to 65, so our thermostat's at floor level, you know, at occupant level, but we've got a lot of stratification where our heat's rising to the ceiling. We're going to see our, you know, temperature at the ceiling potentially at 80 degrees in this situation, or 81 degrees. You can see in that scenario, we've got almost a 22% increase in our roof loss. So it all, ultimately, we've got to, we're trying to keep that temperature at the floor at the same, but if we've got all that heat rising to the ceiling, we're losing it through the roof, and it's not helpful, it's helpful to us. It's increasing our overall heating load. So to address stratification, really we've got to drive that heat down to the floor and, and turn over the air in, within the facility. When you think about a large, large warehouse, there's a lot of different ways we can go about heat distribution. You know, traditionally, you know, in most applications, we think about using ductwork, right? That would be one way to get heat distribution, but in a warehouse, it's probably unrealistic, right? Uh, we're not able to run ductwork over a million square foot warehouse. So we got to find other solutions, right? We can use large air volumes. You know, we can use equipment that turns over the air significantly within the, within the facility, you know, multiple times an hour. And the HVLS fans or high volume, low speed fans can be an excellent option to do that, you know, add that additional equipment. You know, with one 24 foot diameter fan, you can move about 240,000 CFM. So that can move a lot of airflow and prevent that stratification if we need to. But sometimes, you know, cost is the, uh, the driving factor. And that's where utilizing high velocity discharge out of a piece of you know, equipment like a direct gas fired mix barrier unit can be very effective at creating some of that heat distribution within the building and turning over that air. Um, the way this works is by using, you know, kind of throwing the heat into the facility down to the floor and inducing airflow within the space. So for example, that kind of helps explain how this works. We've conducted some com computational fluid dynamics analysis, commonly known as CFD, where we took the diffuser off of our, our equipment and simulated about 10,000 CFM of supply air coming through that diffuser, which results in about a 1,200 feet per minute diffuser velocity. So in this example, you kind of have that gray line there is the diffuser being you know, positioned at about 25, 30 feet above the floor. And we're throwing that air out of the diffuser down to the floor air, kind of represented by the black arrows. So the velocity is shown by the length and the color of these arrows. So the red long arrows are higher velocity. Sorry, I'm in a conference room here. It just shut off the lights on my video. But, um, and so the, uh, the red, red arrows are the uh, higher velocity, green, then blue being the, the lower velocity in this, in this example. So you can kind of see that air being thrown down to the floor splashing along the floor. And as it does throw, as that air velocity moves through the stagnant air in the space, you kind of see how those arrows sort of pull that air into, or it's showing that air being pulled into the, the jet of, of high velocity air. So we're creating and inducing airflow near the diffuser and along that you know, velocity that runs along the floor. Now, if we were to back that out here, you can kind of see the diffuser still on the left side of the screen here, and the air kind of moving out of that diffuser along the floor. And as it loses its velocity and momentum, it's warmer than the, the air in the space, so it rises. And we effectively get this air rotation effect within the, within the facility. Um, so in this scenario, with 10,000 CFM of supply air, we're able to create air rotation in a 325 foot area within the space. So we're getting that effective air rotation, helping to prevent that heat from just rising to the ceiling and staying there by, by rotating the air within the space. Now, you may be kind of thinking, you know, hey, it's a, it's a warehouse. I'm going to have racking in the center of my facility. That's potentially going to be blocking this air rotation. 
So that's where spacing and layout of this type of equipment on warehouses can be pretty critical to try to find those open areas to, to throw the air within the, within the space. So if we look at, say, here's a big example, um, it's about a million square foot warehouse here with 100 dock positions or 102 dock positions on either side of the facility. If we look at the typical warehouse, usually the center of our facility is where we're going to place our rack. And then on either side of that racking, you know, in a typical cross dock warehouse, we'll have our, what we call our speed bay areas. They're going to be about 60 to 70 feet wide, typically, from the dock doors to the first, you know, aisle of racking there. And so those are usually open areas that they're using to stage, load, and unload trucks. So those are areas that are usually great places to position our equipment because we have a nice open area to distribute the heat within the building. Additionally, when we actually think about you know, our warehouse as well, that's where all our dock doors are, that's where a good chunk of our wall area is. So our heat load is really concentrated at, near these dock doors as well. So that's an excellent option, you know, excellent place to concentrate our heating source as well, because that's where the most heating load is. And then lastly, we're actually looking at where our people are located inside a warehouse. They're spending most of their time in these dock areas as well, right? They may run to the center to pick or put away product, but they're always kind of coming back to these dock areas um, to stage, load, unload trucks. So we're able to concentrate the air and the heat in a space where we've got open area to do it. We've got most of our people and it's where our highest load is. So that's really where we wanna concentrate our equipment. So a couple examples of how to lay out some of those, that equipment. Here would be one example of that cross dock facility. And you know, we're kind of zoomed way out on, on a plan of a, a large warehouse here, but you, I've circled kind of the six, six uh, makeup air units here that we're using to heat that facility, kind of concentrated near those dock areas um, in, in the facility. Uh, kind of going to another style, style building here where we may have docks on one side of the building. We, again, we're positioning those four units in this scenario along those dock areas and throwing in towards the center of the building. So the, the key here is we wanna make sure our left and right discharge out of that three-way diffuser on these units is directed along those dock areas. We create a good amount of air rotation in that area where there's open area. And then we're throwing in towards the center, usually down kind of the aisleways between, the, between the, the racking to try to create some rotation into the center of the facility with those units. So maybe a pretty effective way to, to lay out equipment and prevent that stratification from occurring. You know, probably the biggest mistake I see when applying this equipment is using a low, low velocity, say a you know, four-way drop box style diffuser that doesn't get that air down to the floor and create that air rotation effect. When we do that, we just kind of throw it at low velocity, let it hang there. All that heat rises right up to the ceiling with this type of equipment. Kind of regardless of how much air you try to circulate um, with the units, it tends to rise towards the ceiling. So the key is really driving it down to the floor with the velocity out of the diffuser or combining it with HVLS fans to circulate the air within the space. So we kind of look at some of the design takeaways here at a high level. You know, really the key is Accurate skin loads are really critical to providing the most cost-effective system for these applications. And you know, as we kind of mentioned, there's a lot of software out there to help you out with this. And the calculation that that provides is only as accurate as the information put it in. So if we you know, don't have good information, wall, roof, R values, or you know, what kind of temperatures we're trying to heat within the heat to within the space, that that calculation is going to be be inaccurate for us. Secondly, we want to look at that usable heat. Remember that usable heat's kind of what left over after we've heated that outside air to room neutral temperature. We got to make sure we've got enough usable heat to offset our design skin load within the facility. Second thing, you know, another thing we got to want to consider is introducing that outside air to pressurize our buildings against infiltration. Now, providing that positive building pressure helps to prevent that cold air from leaking in and infiltrating around dock doors. Stratification again increasing that heat loss. So making sure we account for that with our equipment selection, provide that air turnover, high velocity discharge to prevent that, that heat from rising to the ceiling 
increasing the operating costs for our facilities is really, really important in these applications. And we want to make sure we're concentrating our heating and speed base near the dock doors. Uh, it's going to be an excellent, excellent way to you know, distribute the heat within the building and keep the uh, heating where our heat load is the highest, where our people spend the most time within those facilities. And then lastly, really take into account that ventilation when you're selecting your equipment. You know, we've got to bring that 0.06 CFM per square foot in for code. So it's really important to make sure that we've got equipment that's able to handle that. Um, and we can dual purpose it for, for heating the facilities as well. So with that, we're going to kind of move into looking at, you know, addressing all those considerations with different types of space heating equipment. Now, I'm going to kind of high level talk a little bit about gas-fired heating. And we kind of talked first here about using direct gas-fired equipment, which would be showcased on the left side here. What you're probably most familiar with is your typical indirect gas-fired equipment. So indirect gas fired equipment uses a heat exchanger. The example shown here is a tubular style heat exchanger. Where we're firing the gas into the tubes, pulling it through with a combustion fan or inducer fan. And then our supplier travels over the top of the tubes and the heat's transferred to the supply air. Um, so we're separating the combustion from our supplier that's going into the space. Now direct gas fired equipment uses a burner like you see in the top left there mounted directly in the airstream. So we're using our outside air we're bringing into the building as our combustion air to heat or to dilute down our byproducts of combustion to safe levels for the, for the occupants in the space. We're getting really maximum heat transfer to the air, but we are introducing those byproducts of combustion to the building. Now, a lot of people kind of go, well, is that safe? You know, it kind of scares you a little bit, right? You're, you're burning the gas in the airstream. Uh, when we look at direct gas fired equipment, the key thing here is we're going through very stringent standards to test and certify that equipment so that the byproducts combustion and the supply airstream are safe for occupancy. So for an example, the OSHA eight hour exposure limit for carbon monoxide is 50 parts per million. Um, with direct gas fired equipment, we need to maintain five parts per million, so 10 times below the, uh, the OSHA exposure limit at all firing rates and at the worst case conditions in terms of burner velocity that that, that unit's gonna see. So when we measure that burner velocity, we measure it with a, with a pressure across the burner. So there's pressure switches to make sure that it maintains within that, those limits and that has to pass at those worst case conditions. So on the low velocity side and the high velocity side and at worst case firing condition. So when you actually are applying that equipment in, in real life, it's dialed in to the right velocity across the burner. Most of the time, we're not using the full capacity of the burner. We're typically well below those, those limits, significantly below the limits um, that, that we see in the worst case testing. And you've got that, that assurance that at the worst case, those still pass that five parts per million parts per million limit. So these are you know, really safe pieces of equipment um, because we are kind of connecting our ventilation air, you know, the amount of air we're bringing into the space with the combustion air. So we never have an issue where we've got, we're not providing ventilation to the space and we're adding um, byproducts of combustion to the, to the building. So they're using a lot of warehouses applications. Um, you've probably seen them a lot in commercial kitchens for makeup air in those situations. A lot of industrial or um, manufacturing process applications as well for providing ventilation air to those those types of applications and they're really an excellent option for heating warehouses as well now when we look at direct gas fired versus indirect gas fired heating you know big one thing to consider is direct gas fired again we're burning it right in the airstream so no venting is required whereas if we're using indirect fired equipment whether it's unit heaters or some other form of, of indirect gas fired heating we need to make sure we're venting that outdoors. So we have vent piping to deal with. Uh, additionally, from an efficiency standpoint, your direct gas fired equipment is gonna be 92% efficient because we're burning that directly in the airstream. Now you may wonder why it's, why, where does the other 8% go to? Well, when you burn gas, about 92% of the energy that's in that natural gas turns it into sensible heat, right? We're raising the temperature of the air. 
the remaining 8% of the energy in that gas turns into water vapor. So we're adding latent energy or moisture to our air with that remaining 8%. So we're getting the full 100%, just 8% of it turns into, into moisture that we're not able to use to heat the building. Now, from an indirect gas-fired heating perspective, typically we're seeing, you know, the typical units are designed to be non-condensing. So for traditional lower cost equipment, it's about 80, maybe 81, 82% efficient at the most. Um, on the top end, you may have some high efficiency options that are condensing style heat exchangers. So the combustion air condenses within the heat exchanger. So those would be your, your 90 plus efficient uh, options there. However, though, with those, you're going to have to deal with the condensate that comes from that, from that system. So we'll have to drain that condensate as well. Drain that condensate, so having to account for that with those high efficiency indirect gas fired options. From an outside air perspective, the direct gas fired equipment does require outside air. Again, we need to dilute those byproducts of combustion, whereas the indirect gas fired equipment, we can recirculate 100% of, of the air through that system. And from a controllability standpoint, direct gas fired equipment usually has about a 30 to one turndown ratio, meaning that if we're have, providing 100 degrees of temperature rise, we can turn it down to, down to about three and a third degrees degrees of, of temperature rise. Whereas with an indirect gas fired furnace, when you have a modulating system, a lot of times it's going to be about a four to one turn down. So 100 degrees of temp rise, our minimum would be 25 degrees of, of temperature rise on a minimum. So get a lot more controllability with the direct gas fired equipment. Now from a cost perspective, we're looking at say a makeup air unit that utilizes both it can utilize both direct gas fired heating or indirect gas fired heating. I mean, the cost is pretty close on small heating capacities. Now, if we're 300 MBH or under, you know, maybe a little bit, about 10% less with direct gas fired equipment. But as we get larger, for direct gas fired units, all we do is make the burner a little longer. So, you know, with our equipment, we can get about 400,000 BTUs and six inch, six inch section of burner. So if we just need more heat, we add another six inches to the burner length and we get additional capacity. So it's really cost effective to add additional heating capacity to direct gas units. Whereas indirect fired units, those furnaces just keep getting larger and larger and larger, or we have to stack furnaces in series to get the heating capacity. And that's where the, the, cost, the cost difference between the equipment starts to diverge as you get larger in heating capacity. So for large heating capacities, you know, direct gas fired equipment is the lowest cost option out there. Now, when we look at different space heating systems, probably the, you know, there's on the top, we've got all indirect fired equipment. So say infrared radiant tube heating, um, where we're you know, combusting gas in the tube and letting it, you know, the energy radiate into the building. And we've got air turnover units, typically using large, large CFMs, large heat exchangers to circulate the air in the building. Um, a lot of times it would be three, four air turnovers or air turnovers an hour with those units. So really large pieces of equipment. And unit heaters are all options, you know, using indirect fire technology. On the bottom, some typical systems are going to be your 80-20 direct gas fired units, as well as your high temperature 100% outside air units. Those are going to be our two typical units we use for space heating applications like warehouses. Now, when we look at Kind of all those design considerations we talked about. And we talked about, you know, obviously heating those buildings. So efficiency is really important for us there. Talked about ventilation, meeting our ASHRAE 62.1 requirements. And then we also talked about, you know, destratification and preventing that air from rising to the ceiling. And last we talked about, you know, pressurizing our space against, um, against infiltration, which kind of correlates into our ventilation capability, our ability to bring outside air in and provide that pressurization. So we look at what types of, what that equipment can handle, you know, that high efficiency. Yes, you can get unit heaters that are in the high efficiency zone, but they don't have that ventilation capability or that destratification capability. You know, infrared tube units, again, no ability to bring that outside air in. They're you know, heating the, you know, the hard surfaces in the building. So a lot of times the air that gets heated by those tends to rise right to the ceiling. Um, air turnover can address you know, some of that ventilation. You can equip them with ventilation systems. 
And they can address that destratification with large amounts of air turn or air turnover in the space, but tend to not hit the efficiency. So when we look at the equipment that kind of checks all the boxes, you know, direct fired equipment really is the, the best solution to hit all those design considerations at really low first cost for those high heating capacities like we talked about earlier. So it's an excellent option for heating these buildings when we get to those large spaces, when we need that ventilation, we're trying to de-stratify those, those tall ceilings um, and we've got large heating capacities that we need. So when we're applying direct gas fired equipment in warehouses, and there's a couple, you know, kind of talk through that in a little more detail here of how that those systems are typically designed and um, applied here. So when we first start with, you know, kind of heating units or heating with 100% outside air. So when we kind of look back at our considerations, remember we've got, got to bring that outside air in to meet our ASHRAE 62.1 requirements or International Mechanical Code requirements. So when we're designing that equipment, you know, direct fire equipment really is an excellent option for that. It's low first cost for the heating capacities, and we get that 92% efficiency. So in this situation, say we need, you know, we're going to get 7,500 CFM of, I mean, 7,500 CFM of ventilation air. We can apply a unit here, heat that zero degree air up to 65 degrees, and it's going to require about 527,000 um, BTUs here to, per hour to do that. Now, we've got that situation. What about, say, our skin load in that space, right? Well, we can either add separate space heating equipment. So we can add some infrared tube heaters or, you know, say, unit heaters within the space. Or we can simply increase the supply temperature of that 100% outside air unit, right? So instead of discharging 65 degrees, Let's crank that bad boy up to about 140 degree discharge. And now we've just added about 607, what we call the usable MBH or usable heat um, with really minimal cost increase. And we talked about just making that burner a little longer. The unit size stays the same in this situation. We've just added another, you know, say six, 12 inches to that burner to get that heating capacity that we need um, at really, really low, low cost increase. So it can be an excellent way to meet your ventilation load and provide heating for, for the facilities. So the big thing that's critical with this is really looking at the discharge temperature of those units. You know, the higher we make that discharge temperature, the less airflow we need to meet the, the heating load for the facility. Um, higher discharge temperature mean, means we can carry the BTUs with less, with less airflow. So this chart kind of um, compares compares that here. So you can see, you know, if again, if we were supplying that air at the same temperature that we're trying to heat it to, effectively you would need infinite infinite amount of airflow to meet the the skin load on the space. So as we raise that discharge temperature, the amount of airflow we need to heat the building comes down. So if we're supplying at that high 140 degree temperature, we're able to heat the heat that building, that 483,000 square foot warehouse here, as an example, with just under 30,000 CFM of, of total airflow. So in this case, the, uh, the you know, we're actually, you know, if we look at that 0.06 CFM per square foot, we're just over that by, by just supplying just over that ventilation requirement to the building, we're able to not only meet the ventilation, but meet the heating load with 100% outside air equipment here. So really cost-effective option for heating some of these warehouses. Now, the other type of equipment that we'll use is going to be an 80-20 recirculating style unit. And the way these units work is we've got 20% outside air that's traveling through the burner as combustion air. So in this situation, we've, with, our, with our design here, we've got a sheet metal divider that's for, you know kind of separating that airstream. So we've got 20% of the air going through the burner. The remaining 80% is either brought in through an outside air damper or return air damper, and it can be a mixture of, mixture of the outside air and return air. And that is all kind of going through a filter section here, bypassing the burner and joining downstream in the supply air. So these units are typically a lot of times referred to as that 80-20 unit because we've got 20% outside air as a minimum, 
the remaining 80% can be a, a mixture of outside air or return air. So some good design practices when we're looking at specifying this type of equipment is we really want to make sure that we've got no return air that's passing you know, through the burner. That's one big consideration to take into account. We don't necessarily know what's in that return air, especially if we're getting into applications like a manufacturing facility where maybe we have you know, aerosol, you know, hydraulic oils or different things like that that may be being pulled into those units. Um, so making sure that that return air doesn't pass through the burner is a big, big consideration. The second thing, just as a good engineering practice, is to filter that outdoor air and return air for better indoor air quality. Those are two things that our design takes into account when, with, with these 8020 style units. So looking at 8020 units and applying them, one of the things that sort of restricts their capability in terms of heating capacity is the standard that they're, they're listed to. So indirect or direct gas fired 8020 units are listed to ANSI 83, Z83.18, which has restricts the temperature rise they're capable of based on the amount of outside air they're bringing into the building. So the reason for this is obviously if we were to recirculate 100% of the air and you know use the direct gas fired burner to heat it, we'd effectively start building up those byproducts of combustion in the space. So we need that outside air to dilute them down to safe levels. And that's where this table kind of comes into, into effect from ANSI 8318. And basically, based on the amount of outside air we're bringing into the building, we're restricted or we've got a max equivalent temperature rise that we're able to provide with the equipment. So that equivalent temperature rise is really just our discharge temperature minus our mixed air temperature that of, of the air coming into the unit for effective mixed air temperature. And what we've actually seen is, you know, the majority of the industry really has settled on about 20% minimum for outside air, hence where the 8020 unit gets its name from. Um, and that allows, you know, some pretty, you know, around that 90 degree discharge temperature in most applications can be a little higher as our outside air temperature gets a little warmer um, in, in certain applications. So that's pretty typical with, with these 8020 style units. Now, when we kind of go back and we remember, hey, we talked about that 100% outside air unit, the key was that high discharge temperature. That allowed us to heat that building with you know, very little total airflow. So when we deal with those 8020 style units and we're recirculating 80% of the air, our max discharge temperature here would be 90 degrees. And in that situation, we're got to provide almost 90,000 CFM of total airflow to the space. So when, with 8020 units, obviously we need larger equipment to handle that airflow going into the building, um, but we've got a lot of controllability over the amount of outside air we're supplying. So in this situation, you know, our minimum outside air is just is around 18,000 CFM here. So in that situation, you know, we're able to control that outside air and dial it right in to what we need for minimum. And then in unoccupied times, you know, we can cut that airflow back to 20% you know, outside air for some energy cost savings there on the gas heating side. So when we look at, you know, kind of comparing and contrasting this type of equipment for warehouse applications, you know, 8020 units are typically, you know, the big advantage there is we're able to adjust that amount of outside air. So we've got you know, max discharge temperature of 90 to 100 degrees typically, um, but the big key is that adjustability allows us to dial in the amount of outside air. We get a little bit lower operating costs, higher efficiency, and a lot of times we will control those dampers in those units based on building pressure. We kind of talked about how that building pressure can help prevent infiltration through dock doors. So this really gives you that capability to dial in that pressure in the space and make that space more comfortable um, by holding high pressure levels in the building. So it can be really, really effective in those situations. Now the 100% outside air units, big advantages here is for a given amount of airflow, we're kind of maximizing the amount of heat and ventilation delivered to the space. So to heat and ventilate a large warehouse, 100% you know, outside air units are typically gonna be your lowest initial cost solution for those, those buildings. That outside air we're bringing in pressurizes the space, 
provides our ventilation for ASHRAE 62.1 um, and you know, kind of helps us meet those indoor air quality requirements. And then that high discharge temperature is providing that usable heat to offset any of the, the skin load or conduction load in the, that building. So those are the two typical types of, of equipment that we're going to use in a lot of these applications for heating. And kind of the, again, the trade-off typically is low cost, you know, initial cost, but 100% outside air units. Um, and from the 80-20 units, typically higher first cost because we've got more airflow we got to move. They're typically larger, um, making the units typically larger, but we get operating cost savings over the lifetime of the equipment. So now last piece is, you know, when we look at ventilation requirements for these spaces, you know, those 100% outside air units, a lot of times they're designed to, you know, are set up to cycle on a call for heating. And we only want to run them when there's a heat, heat demand. But if we need to meet those ventilation rates, we want to basically control them so that, you know, we've got enough units on to meet our 62.1 requirements and then cycle the rest of the units um, to maintain heating, um, heating levels within the building. Uh, when it comes to those 80-20 style units, a lot of times what we'll do is size them so that, or set the damper, minimum damper position so that we're always meeting our minimum outside air requirements during occupied times. And, and then potentially in the unoccupied times, we'll, we'll, we can cycle those units as well um, to reduce operating costs and prevent bringing in unnecessary amounts of outside air while that building is unoccupied. So the typical control options when it comes to using these, this equipment is you know, run it continuously during the occupied times, use that high discharge temperature to provide heating as needed. And then in the unoccupied times, you know, we'll set them up so that they'll cycle on a call for heat and just discharge at high discharge temperatures. So with that, kind of wrapping this, wrapping everything up here and kind of talking about, you know, some of the things we, we've, in summary, we've kind of talked about today. You know, a big thing is to take into all take into account all our design considerations when selecting our equipment. We want to make sure we're not only talking about our heating requirements, but our ventilation, our pressurization against infiltration, as well as our heat distribution to help prevent stratification from within the space. And when it comes to these large, large heated spaces like warehouses and distribution centers, you know, direct gas fire equipment is really ideally suited to, to hit to hit all the design criteria for these spaces. You know, we've got 92% thermal efficiency, so very efficient operation. We've got the ability to ventilate those spaces and bring outside air in, you know, and meet our, meet our codes, and also pressurize that space against infiltration, and really low first costs for those high heating capacities that we need to heat those large buildings. So it can be an excellent option for this app, these applications. So with that, kind of turn it over here to any questions that you guys may have regarding heating warehouses with direct gas-fired equipment. 